Jesus saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. And as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And while he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his cloak. And she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, for your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for this girl is not dead but sleeping, and they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up, and the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of the Lord. to be seated. What is the foundation of our relationship with God? What is the foundation of our relationship with God? That question really lies at the heart of Paul's letter to the church, to the Roman Christians, the congregation in Rome. What is the foundation for our relationship with God? And for Paul, when Paul tells the story of his life, at various points in, in the New Testament in Paul's letters, we catch little uh, tidbits about Paul's life as he recounts his experiences. And we find that Paul, for much of his life, Paul felt that the foundation of his relationship with God was founded in the keeping of religious tradition, custom, and religious laws. Paul, through much of his life, was a very observant Jewish man. In fact, I think he remained a very observant Jewish man up until his death. But in the early years of his life, he was really obsessed with observing all of the customs, traditions, and laws of his faith. And at certain points in his life, he even took great pride in his ability to keep God's law, which I think is ironic. He said, I was not just a Pharisee, but I was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he said, there was no one who kept God's law with greater zeal than I did, and who observed the customs of our faith. And as if his zeal for keeping the law 
wasn't enough, he goes on to say, and my pedigree, my religious pedigree, can also be traced through my bloodline, because not only was I a Pharisee, but I was the son of a Pharisee, and I was trained by one of the most highly respected Pharisees of my day. So Paul was a Pharisee, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, trained by the leading Pharisee, and he himself was the son of a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. But Paul reaches the point in his life where he begins to realize that even the most zealous keeping of religious law and custom and tradition was still lacking something. And so to begin to explain what it was that he was lacking, in this letter to the Romans, Paul uses Abraham and Sarah as an example of what he's talking about, of this thing that was missing in his spiritual life. And so he raises up Abraham and indirectly Abraham's wife, Sarah, to make a point. He says, you know, Abraham and Sarah our grandfather and grandmother in the faith, well, they lived before the law of Moses was even handed down in Mount Sinai. So there's Abraham and Sarah in this relationship with God long before God had even given the law. And Abraham and Sarah knew nothing of the customs that came to define religious faith as it was practiced by Paul hundreds of years later. So Paul says, what then really is the foundation for a relationship with God? What did Abraham and Sarah have as their foundation, as the foundation for their relationship with God? Because it couldn't be law and it couldn't be religious custom because they lived before the law and religious custom had even been handed down. So what was it? And he comes to the conclusion that the foundation for Abraham and Sarah's relationship with God was their willingness to trust God and to take a first step forward in faith, trusting God. Because you see, Abraham and Sarah were called by God to leave their home, leave their homeland, leave everything that was familiar to them, and to set out on a journey to this new place, this new land, this new home, that God had in store for them. And believe me, that's no simple call, especially in a day before interstates and holiday inns. But Abraham and Sarah trust God enough to say yes to God's invitation and to take the next faithful step. Abraham and Sarah, if you read through the book of Genesis, Abraham and Sarah were not without their faults. They were not without their doubts. They were not without their struggles. But what they did have was just enough faith that they could trust God to take the next faithful step towards the future that God had in store for them. And scripture tells us, as Paul recounts, that that willingness to trust God enough to take the next faithful step was counted to them as righteousness. That it was not their perfection. It was not their perfection in obedience or their perfection of faith that made them righteous in God's sight. It was simply that they had enough faith in God, enough trust, that they were willing to take the next step in faith towards the future God had in store for them. And if we look at the gospel reading that we heard from just moments ago from Matthew's gospel, at the very beginning of this reading, we have a similar story. It's not about Abraham and Sarah. Rather, it's about St. Matthew, the apostle. And there's nothing, at least on the surface, that would present Matthew as a likely candidate for apostleship or discipleship. For Matthew is a Jewish man, but he has made a decision, the professional decision, to become a tax collector on behalf of the Roman Empire. So among his Jewish countrymen, 
Matthew was essentially a pariah and a collaborator with the oppressor. Matthew, by becoming a tax collector, essentially burned every social and religious bridge he had. And there he is, going about his day-to-day -day life, when one day Jesus walks by. And we don't know why, but Jesus asks Matthew to come follow him. Jesus extends this invitation. And Matthew says, yes. Maybe because of Matthew's social situation, maybe he felt he had nothing else to lose at this point. He was already a pariah among his own people. But for whatever reason, he trusted Jesus enough to say yes and to take the next faithful step of following Jesus. And we find this same pattern repeated over and over again with nearly all of the disciples. They're all very ordinary people that Jesus extends an invitation to, and each one of them in their own way musters up enough trust in God or enough trust in this person, Jesus, to say yes and to move forward in faith. And goodness knows, if you've read the Gospels, you know that the disciples were no paragons of perfection. They had their failures, their doubts, their struggles, and for goodness sakes, they couldn't follow directions to save their lives. But they were counted worthy simply because they had enough trust in Jesus to take the next faithful step. And so that same dynamic is true for us today, 2,000 years later. The foundation of our faith in God is really to be found in our willingness to trust God enough to take the next step, whatever the next step may be. That's true for us as individual Christians, and it's also true for us as a congregation as a whole. This congregation at Advent has been through a lot of change and transition over the last decade, and not all of it was easy. And even more recently, as a congregation, we've emerged from a pandemic. We are working really hard, both our lay leaders and our laity are working very hard to get our ministries back up off the ground. We're also, you've, we've elected new vestry members, you've called a new rector. There's been a lot of change just in the last seven months. And in the midst of that, one of the questions that I frequently receive from folks ever since I arrived here is, what is your vision for us as a church? Where are we going or where are you leading us? And my response when I get that question is, I really don't know probably not the answer you want to hear at this moment, right? The truth is, I don't know exactly what God has in store for us. I believe that God has a future for us and that God is calling us into a future where we can and will thrive. But I don't know in this moment exactly what that future looks like or exactly how we're going to get there. But what I do know is each day we are called to take the next faithful step, whatever that step may be. And that the foundation of our faith in God is the willingness to simply trust God enough, not trust God perfectly. God doesn't demand perfection in our faith. God doesn't demand perfection in our obedience. Thank God for that. But what God does ask, for us, ask of us is that we have enough faith, enough trust to take the next faithful step when it becomes clear to us what that step is. That's my promise to you as your rector, is that as we gain clarity each day about the next step, my promise to you is that I will muster enough faith and trust in God to lead us in taking that next step. Because that's really what our relationship with God is all about.
It's not about strict observance of religious custom. It's not about obedience to the law. It's not about having a perfect, unwavering, undoubting faith. It's simply about trusting God enough to say yes to God's invitation, taking God's hand, and taking the next step, whatever that may be. And thanks be to God that we aren't alone in this endeavor because we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the saints of our past, whether it be Matthew or Paul or Abraham and Sarah, who know exactly what it is to live day to day with just enough trust in God to take the next step. That's how our faith has gone from one generation to the next, and that's how it will move forward from us to those who will come after us. So my sisters and brothers, I call to you today, and I ask you, trust God enough to take the next faithful step with me towards the future that God has in store for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.